so today we are going to discuss MVG3 block 7. We are going to discuss James Joyce, the portrait of the artist as a young man. As a young man. Let's begin with the biography of the author. I hope all of you can hear me. Just write in the chat box, please. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, we are starting with the biography of the author. James Joyce was born in 1882 and he died in 1941. He was uh, an Irish novelist. He belonged to Ireland. He was a short story writer, a novelist, a poet, a teacher, and a literary critic. He contributed to the modernist avant-garde, what is known as the avant-garde, the more modern age of literature he belonged to. And he is regarded as one of the most influential and important authors of the 20th century. Joyce is best known for Ulysses, which he published in 1922, a landmark work in which the episodes of Homer's Odyssey are paralleled in a variety of literary styles, most famously known as stream of consciousness. You must be familiar with this term, stream of consciousness. The other well-known works by choice are the short story collection, Dubliners. Dublin, the name of a town in Ireland, Dubliners. Published in 1940, and the novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man, and Finnegan's Week, a portrait of the artist as a young man, published in 1916, and Finnegan's Week, another novel in 1939. His other writings include three books of poetry, a play, and his published letters and occasional journalism. So, Joyce was born in Dublin into a middle class family. He was a brilliant student. He briefly attended the Christian Brothers Ron O'Connell School before he excelled at the Jesuit School Clongo um, Wish and Belvedere. The, I mentioned the name of the schools because they feature in his novels. Despite the chaotic family life imposed by his father's unpredictable finances, he went on to attend the University College in Dublin. So he was a bright student, though uh, the finances of the family was not good. And in 1904, in his early 20s, Joyce emigrated to continental Europe with his partner, who later became his wife, Nora Barnacle. Nora Barnacle. They lived in uh, Trieste, Paris, and Zurich, different places in Europe. Although most of his adult life was spent abroad, John's fictional universe centers on Dublin. And it is populated largely by characters who closely resemble family members, enemies, and friends from his time there. The Ulysses in particular is said with precision in the streets of the city of Dublin. Shortly after the publication of Ulysses, he elucidated his preoccupation somewhat saying that uh, he, I'm quoting here from James Joyce. He said, for myself, I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of all the cities of the world. In the particular, it's content the universal. So let's talk about his major works the major books by James Joyce. Let's begin with the Dubliners. Dubliners, simply Dubliners. It's a collection of short stories. 15 short stories by Joyce. It was first published in 1914. They form a naturalistic depiction of Irish middle-class life in and around Dublin in the early years of 20th century. Then these stories were written when Irish nationalism was at its peak. 
and a search for a national identity and purpose was high. The story centered on uh, Joy's idea of an epiphany. Epiphany, remember, we are going to discuss epiphany towards the end of uh, this lecture because he has used it in a portrait of the artist also. Epiphany is a moment when a character experiences a life-changing self-understanding or illumination. I repeat, epiphany is a moment when a character experiences a life-changing self-understanding or illumination. Uh, then many of the characters in Dubliners left her appear in minor roles in George's novel, Ulysses. The initial stories in the collection are narrated by child protagonists. This is a specialty in the short story collection, that the initial stories are narrated by child protagonists. Subsequent stories deal with the lives and concerns of progressively older people. And this aligns with uh, joyous tripartite tribes, three division of the collection into childhood, adolescence, and maturity. So this was something about Dubliners, a collection of short stories by James Joyce. Next, a portrait of the artist is a young man, published in 1916. It's a nearly complete rewrite of the abandoned novel Stephen Hero. He started writing a novel called Stephen Hero, and he rewrote it. He left it in the middle. He rewrote it and the a portrait of the artist as a young man came out. So Joyce attempted to burn the original manuscript in a fit of rage because he was angry. During an argument with Nora, his girlfriend and later wife, though to his subsequent relief, it was rescued by his sister. A portrait of the artist as a young man is held as a Kunstel Roman. K U N S T L E double R O M A N. Kunstel Roman. Kunstel Roman, we are going to discuss later. Epiphany, Kunstel Roman. Kunstel Roman is a form of Bildung's Roman. A coming up a story, but, but it is different from a Bildung's Roman. How? We shall discuss later. So a portrait is a heavy autobiographical coming of age novel depicting the childhood and adolescence of the protagonist, Stephen Detalus. Stephen Detalus is the protagonist. S-T-E-P-S-E-N, Stephen, D-E-D-A-L-U-S. Stephen Detalus is the protagonist of a portrait and his gradual growth into artistic self-consciousness. Some hints of the technique just frequently employed in later works, uh, such as stream of consciousness, interior manula, you need to remember these two terms, stream of consciousness. Discuss portrait of an artist, uh, of the artist as a young man as a stream of consciousness novel. Or you may get a question. <laughs> Show the use of interior manola in uh, a portrait of the artist. Excuse. Switch off your microphones, please. Yes, please. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Ma'am, could you please tell me the which book we are studying right now? We are discussing MEG three block seven. MEG three block seven. Block seven. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, James Joyce. A portrait of the artist as a young man. So I was telling it is a constant romance. It's a heavily autobiographical coming of age novel depicting the childhood and adolescence of the protagonist Stephen Titalus and his gradual growth into artistic self consciousness. Some hints of the techniques Joyce frequently employed in letter works, such as stream of consciousness and interior monologue. You need to remember these two phrases because we are going to discuss more about it towards the end of the lecture. And it's important. And the references to a character's psychic reality rather than his external surroundings are evident throughout the novel. 
just a short introduction here on a portrait of the artist as a young man. Then Exiles and his poetry. Exiles was the only play he wrote. Exiles was the name of a play, a drama that James Joyce wrote. It began shortly after the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 and published in 1918. A study of a, a husband and wife relationship. The play looks back to the dead, the final story in Dublin. And it forward to Ulysses. So it's, it's a kind of breeze between these two books, or the two stories, which Joyce began around the time of the play's composition. So this was a play, Exiles. Next, uh, poetry. Joyce also published a number of books of poetry. Its first major published work was the satirical broadside the holy office, in which he proclaimed himself to be the superior of many prominent members of the Celtic revival. Celtic means idols revival, which was a movement. His first collection was Chamber Music. He also wrote many other poems and published many other collections. Next, we have to discuss Ulysses. Ulysses because it's a groundbreaking work and it is worth discussing. As he was completing the work on Dubliners, don't press that present now button please. Just switch off your audio and video. So as he was completing the work on Dubliners in 1906, Joyce considered adding fishing a Jewish advertising canvasser called Leopold Bloom. Leopold Bloom. L-E-O-P-O-L-D-B-L-O-O-M. Leopold Bloom. Under the title Ulysses. This, this is the central character in Ulysses. Although he did not pursue the idea further at that time, he eventually commenced work on a novel using both the title and the basic premise in 1914. The writing was completed in October 1921. So, so uh, partly because of uh, the uh, this uh, Ulysses, it provoked the first accusations of obscenity with which the book would be identified for so long. Its amorphous structure with frank, intimate musings, thinking, or what we call stream of consciousness, were seen to uh, offend both the church and the state. So the book is said to be full of obscenity. And partly because of this controversy, Joyce found it difficult to get a publisher to accept the book. But it was published in 1922 by Sylvia Beach. So Ulysses was published in 1922. With the occurrence of both Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's poem, The Westland, in 1922 was a key year in the history of English language literary modernism. In modern literature, what we call the modern age of English literature, two groundbreaking, path-breaking works were Ulysses by James Joyce and The Westland by T.S. Eliot, and both of them came in the year 1922. Then in Ulysses, Joyce employed stream of consciousness, parody, jokes, and virtually every other literary technique to present his characters. The action of the novel, which takes place in a single day, remember the action of Ulysses took place in a single day, 16th June 1904. It states the characters and the incidents of Odyssey of Homer in modern Dublin. I repeat, the story of Ulysses sets the characters and incidents of Odyssey of Homer, the classical epic, in modern Dublin and represents Odysseus or Ulysses, Pangov, his wife, and his son Telemachus in the character of Leopard Blue, his wife Molly Blue 
and Stephen Detallus. Stephen Detallus also occurs in the character of Stephen Detallus also occurs in Ulysses. And it periodically contrasted with their lofty models. These three characters, they resemble Ulysses, Penula, and Telemachus of Meath. From these characters are from Odyssey of Homer. The book explores various areas of Dublin life, dwelling on its squalor and monotony. Nevertheless, the book is also an affectionately detailed study of the city. And Joyce claimed that if Dublin were to be destroyed in some catastrophe or disaster, it could be, it could be reconstructed brick by brick. And Joyce claimed that uh, it can use uh, Ulysses, the, his book, as a model. There is such a real description of Dublin in that book. I repeat that Ulysses, so John claimed that if Dublin were to be destroyed in some catastrophe, it could be rebuilt brick by brick using his work as a model. So the book Ulysses consists of, we have to discuss a portrait of the artist, but I want to shed some light on Ulysses because it is such an important book in modern literature. So the book Ulysses consists of 18 chapters, each covering roughly one hour of the day. Because I told you that the book covers only one day in the life of these three main characters. So each uh, chapter covering roughly one hour of the day, beginning around about 8 a.m. and ending sometimes after 2 a.m. the following morning. Each of the 18 chapters of the novel employs its own literary style. Each chapter also refers to a specific episode in Homer's Odyssey and has a specific color, art, or science and bodily organ associated with it. So this, these are something uh, which are important about Ulysses. Just remember that much, a very uh, short outline of the novel. Then next we have the novel by James Joyce, Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake. After completing Ulysses or having completed work on Ulysses, Joyce was so adjusted that he did not write a line of prose for a whole year. Then in 1923, he informed his patron, Harriet Shaw Weaver. He said that yesterday I wrote two pages. The first I have since the final years of Ulysses. And the wolf may lose his skin, but not his voice. It's a proverb. You have to tell me the meaning. Why he told so. I repeat the whole thing. So after completing Ulysses, Joyce did not write a single line of prose for a whole year because he was so exhausted. But then he informed his patron that yesterday I wrote two pages. Because uh, the wolf may lose his skin, but not his voice. Or the leopard cannot change his spots. So what's the meaning? Tell me. Ma'am, may I try? Yes. Um, I sure. think uh, a person is known by his characteristic features. So a poet yes. uh, cannot live without writing. As, uh, you know, uh, a mother cannot live without loving his, uh, uh, sorry, her children. Such is the character of a poet. It is like his own uh, children without nurturing them, like a gardener also. Uh, uh, I mean, Very this is there in the blood, I think. Very good. You had English honors? Yeah, I'm English honors. And uh, I'm teacher. Very obvious. Yeah. Yes. Very obvious. So he could not live without writing. That means he cannot uh, abandon, leave his nature. Uh, so thus was born a text that became known as work in progress in the beginning. A letter he named it Finnegan's Wake. It took him some years to complete the novel and John's method of stream of consciousness, literary allusions, free dream associations, 
were pushed to the limit in Finnegan's wake because it was a much mature kind of work. It abandoned all conventions of flood and character construction and is written in a peculiar and austere English based mainly on complex multi level puns. P U N S. What's the meaning of pun? Can anybody tell? P U N pun. Ma'am, it's double meaning. Double meaning. Very good. Same spelling, different meaning. The same word. Or double meaning words. For example, suppose the word M A I D maid. She's a maid. A, an unmarried woman. Or oh, really, she's a maid, a servant, working like a servant. So, Shakespeare often uh, used puns in his dramas for the sake of witism in language. So, uh, James Joyce also employed it in his works. So, we discussed about different prominent works of uh, James Joyce. Dublin's a short story collection published in 1940. Then we talked about a portrait of the artist as a young man. It's a novel published in 1916. Then Ulysses, another heartbreaking novel by him, published in 1922, the same year when T.S. Eliot's uh, The Westland was published. Then Finnegan's Way was published in 1939. So we also talked about different poetry collections and he also wrote a play called Exiles, which was published in 1918. This was something about the background. Let's come to a portrait of the artist as a young man. Uh, it's a story of around 300 or more pages, but we will try to be short. Be attentive and listen to me. Uh, so a portrait of the, before that, just a few words about the book. A portrait of the artist as a young man is the first novel of uh, artist writer James Joyce because the Dubliner was a short story collection. And you say, uh, Kunstel Roman, I told you, Kunstel Roman, different from Bildung's Roman. It's also a growing up story, but uh, growing up of an artist in particular is called a Kunstel Roman. It's written in a modernist style, which traces the religious and intellectual awakening of young Stephen Detalus. Stephen Detalus is the protagonist of the novel. He's a fictional alter hero of James Joyce himself. And the name is an allusion, is a reference to Daedalus of Greek mythology. Daedalus, the consumer, the perfect craftsman of Greek mythology. The Second name, Daedalus, has been borrowed from Greek mythology. So Stephen questions and rebels against the Catholic and Irish conventions under which he has grown, culminating in his self-exile from Ireland to Europe. The work uses the techniques that Joyce developed more fully in Ulysses and Finnegan's way. What's the technique? Yes. What's the technique which, you, uh, which James Joyce started using in a portrait of the artist, then he fully developed it in Ulysses and Finnegan's way? Man's stream of consciousness. Very good. Very good. A portrait became, uh, uh, began in 1904 as Stephen Hero. He projected 63 chapter autobiographical novel in a realistic style. But after 25 chapters, Joyce abandoned Stephen Hero in 1907 and he set to reworking its themes and protagonists into a condensed, a compact five chapter novel, dispensing with strict realism and making extensive use of free, indirect speech that allows the reader to peer into Stephen's developing consciousness. So American modernist poet Ezra Pound had the novel serialized in uh, the English magazine, The Egoist, in 1914. 
it was serialized, it was serialized in the egoist by Ezra Pound 1914 and 15 and it was published as a book in 1916 so the publication of uh, a portrait and the short story collection Dubliner earned Joyce a place at the forefront of literary modernism. Then let's come to the summary, a kind of synopsis to the whole story. Yeah, the story will be short because it's an exercise in stream of consciousness because there will be less events where there is much more of thinking and musing. So the childhood of Stephen Detalus, who is the main character, is recounted using vocabulary that changes as he grows. It's told in a voice not his own, but sensitive to his feelings. The reader experiences Stephen's fears and bewilderment as he comes to terms with the world in a series of disjointed episodes. Stephen attends the Jesuit run Plongo West Wood College. Yeah, I mentioned the name in case of Joyce also. It is autobiographical in nature. Where the apprehensive, intellectually gifted boy suffers the ridicule of his classmates while he learns the schoolboy course of behavior, a boarding school that was for boys. While he cannot grasp their significance, the significance of those codes prescribed for those boys. At a Christmas dinner, he is uh, witness to the social, political, and religious tensions in Ireland involving Charles Parnell. Charles Parnell uh, is a, a, a historical figure. And uh, uh, James Joyce was much influenced by him. Though he is not a character in the book, his influence is profound in the book, Charles Parnell who is related to the Irish movement. Uh, so uh, he, yes, it leaves Stephen with doubts over his social institution, social institutions. He can place his faith in. Back in the school, what spreads that a number of older boys have been caught smogging. Smogging is a term which refers to the secret homosexual horseplay that the five students were caught at. And discipline is tightened in the school. And the Jesuits increase of corporeal punishment, the corporal punishment in the school. And Stephen is trapped when one of his instructors believes he has broken his glass, his glasses to avoid studying. One of his instructors believed that Stephen had broken his glasses to avoid studying. But prodded by his classmate, Stephen walks up uh, the courage to complain to the rector, Father Conme, Father Conme, C O N M E E, -E who assures him that there will be no such recurrence, leaving Stephen with a sense of triumph because he complained against an instructor and he won. So, this is something from his school life. And then Stephen's father gets into debt, he borrowed. And the family leaves its pleasant south urban home to live in Dublin. They went to live in Dublin. Stephen realizes that he will not return to uh, Clongo West, that college, their school. However, thanks to the scholarship obtained for him by Father Conme, Father Conme, the head of their school, the rector, he helped him. And Stephen is able to attend. Belvedere College, Belvedere College, where he excels academically and becomes a class leader. Then Stephen squanders a large cash prize from the school and he begins to see prostitutes. He begins to see prostitutes as distance grows between him and his drunken father. He's growing into adolescence. Stephen's growing into adolescence. As Stephen abandons himself to sensual pleasures, his class is taken on a religious retreat. But the boys sit through the sermon. Uh, Stephen pays special attention to those on pride, guilt, punishment, and the last four things like death, judgment, hell, and heaven. They were given training in 
Christianity. He feels that the words of the sermon describing horrific internal, uh, eternal punishment in hell are directed at himself and over them uh, comes to desire forgiveness. He is impressed by Christianity, the sermon. Overjoyed at his return to the church, he devotes himself to the act of ascetic repentance. He repents for his sensual being involved in sensual pleasures. Though they soon devolve into uh, mere arts of routine, as his thoughts turn elsewhere. His devotion comes to the attention of the Jesuits, and they encourage him to consider entering priesthood. He was so devoted, or he, he was so, so devoted that they encouraged him to enter into priesthood. The Stephen takes time to consider, but has a crisis of faith because of the conflict between his spiritual beliefs and his aesthetic ambition. So in the whole story, the main theme is the crisis, the conflict between Stephen's spiritual beliefs and his aesthetic ambitions. Along Dolly Mount Strand, he spots a girl wedding and has an epiphany in which he is overcome with the desire to find a way to express her beauty in his writing. Yeah, that girl Molly. He wrote poetry, poems on her. As a student at University College Dublin, Stephen grows increasingly wary of the institutions around him. Church, school, politics, family, everything. He's not interested in any of this. In the midst of the disintegration of his family's fortunes, his father, his father criticizes him and his mother urges him to return to the church. An increasingly dry, humorless Stephen explains his alienation from the church and the aesthetic theory he has developed to his friends, who find that they cannot accept either of them, neither his opinion of the church nor his aesthetic theory. So Stephen concludes that Ireland is too restricted to allow him to express himself fully as an artist. So he decides that he will have to leave Ireland. He sets his mind on self-imposed exile, but will not, uh, without declaring in his diary, his ties to his homeland. He left Ireland, but he said that he is much attached to Ireland. He says that I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to first to establish in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. I will ever be attached to my race, he said. So this is, uh, you can say, the story of uh, a portrait of the artist. It's, the, it's a development of character. It's a growing of story. I will repeat this so that you will understand it better. Then let's move on to the style. It's a uh, body. It's a, important to tell something about the style of the novel. The novel is a Bildungsroman, a growing up story of Stephen Tritalus, the protagonist. And it captures the essence of character growth and understanding of the world around him. The novel is written primarily as a third person narrative with minimal dialogue until the final chapter. The chapter includes dialogue intensive scenes, alternately involving Stephen, Devin, and Cranley, three characters. An example of such a scene is one in which Stephen positions his complex Thomas aesthetic theory in an extended dialogue. So Charles employs first person narration for Stephen's diary entries. Remember, Charles employs first person narration for Stephen's diary entries in the concluding pages of the novel. Perhaps to suggest that Stephen has finally found his own voice. The beginning part is a third person narrative, but in the end it becomes first person diary entry, suggesting that Stephen has found his own voice and no longer needs to absorb the stories of others. So Joyce fully employs the free indirect style to demonstrate Stephen's 
his intellectual development from his childhood through his education to his increasing independence and ultimate exile from Ireland as a young man. The portrait of the artist as a young man. The style of the work progresses through each of the five chapters as the complexity of language as Stephen's ability to comprehend the world around him both gradually increased. The book's opening pages communicate Stephen's full stirring of consciousness when he is a child. And throughout the work, the language is used to describe indirectly the state of mind of the protagonist and the subjective effect of the events on his life or of his life. So this is the style, the steam of consciousness we have to you know, talk about. Let's talk about the questions so that you will know how to approach this particular book. Uh, so the previous year questions are, what is stream of consciousness? Discuss a portrait of the artist as a young man that employs this technique. Then the second question, comment on the growth of Stephen in a portrait of the artist. Growth of Stephen, Bildung's romance a poster roman then what do you understand by the term stream of consciousness again the same question elaborate upon various styles used by joyce in a portrait then five uh, choice uh, sorry joyce uses epiphany and the stream of consciousness in a portrait elaborate so we have to find out what is stream of consciousness what is epiphany then how Joyce has used these two things in a portrait. Comment on the structure of a portrait, the structure, the five parts, how it has been developed. We'll talk about it. Then analyze the structure of a portrait again in December 11th, yeah. and it was in December 17 also. In what ways does the point of view keep varying in a portrait? illustrated with examples. Of course, when you write uh, answers in the exam, you have to illustrate. When you make a particular point, you have to either quote some dialogues or cite some scenes from that novel to support your argument. Then discuss the narrative technique in a portrait. Next, discuss the symbols used in the novel or portrait. Then discuss the narrative technique in Joyce's prescribed novel. So there were questions on narrative technique, structure, stream of consciousness, is the narrative technique, then use of epiphany, and the Bildung's from and how the growth of Stephen has been featured in a portrait. Next, discuss how Stephen relates to women in a portrait. Particularly when we talk about the meeting phase, the adolescent phase, when he visited prostitutes and wrote poems about Molly without directly knowing her. Then discuss the main principles of aesthetic put forward by Stephen in a portrait. What is the aesthetic theory he developed toward the end? Then analyze the structure of the novel, a portrait. Then how is a portrait of the artist as a young man uh, a modernist novel? in terms of style and content. We have to find out what is a modernist novel, what are the features of a modernist novel, and how a portrait of, an art, of the artist have, uh, has those features. In what way does a portrait leave the growing up and the early years of an artist, growing up story? Then June 19, discuss the stream of consciousness technique with reference to a portrait. So when we see the questions of previous years, we find that mostly there are questions on stream of consciousness technique, epiphany, modernist novel, structure, narrative technique, which is equal to stream of consciousness technique. Then Stephen, the development of Stephen or a, uh, a portrait as a builder's man. These are the questions which uh, have been repeated over the years. Let's go to the characters first. Just uh, we will, I follow the same pattern. 
while discussing all the novels you must have marked that we first talk about the background of the author or the background of the period then background of the author then we discuss about the story or the a summary of the novel then we move to characters then to themes then we discuss about uh, the symbols and motifs then the ignore material so i follow the same format for all the lectures because i want you to understand things and i want you to anticipate what we are going to discuss a talk next so that it will be easy for you to understand things or develop insights into different novels so let's begin with the characters the main character is tell me who is the main character stephen mam stephen yes very good stephen dedalus stephen dedalus the main character of uh, portrait of the artist as a young man is stephen dedalus and growing up stephen goes through long phases of hedonism hedonism is s e d o n i s m hedonism is pleasure seeking a self indulgence he is, so he went through the phases of uh, pleasure seeking hedonism at the same time he also went through the phase of deep religiosity deep religiosity two contrasting things in a young man he eventually adopts uh, the philosophy of uh, aestheticism aestheticism greatly valuing beauty and art stephen is essentially joyous alter ego i, I told you earlier also alter ego and many of the events of stephen's life they mirror the events from james joyce own youth and we have other characters like uh, simon detallus who is stephen's father and impoverished former medical student with a strong sense of irish patriotism and he sentimental about his past and he frequently talks about his youth his father then we have mary detallus who is the mother of stephen and mary is a very religious lady and she argues with her son about attending religious services then we have the other detallus children though his siblings do not play a major role in the novel stephen has several brothers and sisters including this kepti meki and bodi he had several siblings though they do not play a major role in the novel then another character is emma clary stephen's beloved the young girl to whom he is fiercely attracted over the course of many years emma clary and stephen constructs emma is an ideal of femininity even though he does not know her well sorry i told modi i think so it's emma and so mr john casey is another character he is a friend of simon detallus who attends the christmas dinner at which young stephen is allowed to sit with the adults for the first time and like simon mr casey is a staunch believer in irish nationalism Uh, and at the dinner, he argues with Dante over the fate of Parnell, that Irish politician. Uh, then Charles Stewart Parnell, he is an Irish political leader who is not an actual character in the novel, but whose death influences many of its characters. Parnell had powerfully led the Irish National Party until he was condemned for having an affair with a married woman. then dante is another character with steel deformed and pious the catholic governess of the detallus children okay, so dante was the governess of detallus children uh, then uncle charles uncle charles is stephen's lively great uncle and charles lives in stephen's family during the summer the young stephen enjoys we are taking long walks with the uncle and listening to charles and simon discuss the history of both ireland and the detallus family we have also father conmee conmee c o n m e e 
the rector at his college, where Stephen attended attend school as a young boy. Then we have several other characters like Father Dolan, Wales, or Anthony, Brother Michael, then Fleming, uh, Father uh, Arnold. So many characters are there. The Cranley, uh, Devine, Lynch, Macken, Temple, the Dean of Studies. All these are characters. So uh, these are the characters, but mostly the character of Stephen is important because we get questions on the character development of Stephen Diddles. Uh, let's come to the themes now. Themes are important. Uh, the first theme would be the development of individual consciousness, the development of a character of Stephen. So the most uh, famous aspect of a portrait, let me take the time. Well, it's not one hour yet. Uh, so first the development of individual consciousness. The most famous aspect of a portrait of the artist as a young man is Joyce's innovative use of stream of consciousness. A style in which the author directly transcribes the thoughts and sensations that go through a character's mind rather than simply describing those sensations from external standpoint of an observer. He went deep into the mind of the character. He is not an observer. He entered the mind. So Joy's use of stream of consciousness makes a portrait of the artist which a young man a story of the development of Stephen's mind. In the first chapter, the very young Stephen is only capable of describing his uh, or describing his world in simple words and phrases because he is a child. And the sensations that he experiences are all jumbled together with a child's lack of attention to cause and effect. See how language, story, development of mind, all these are integrated in this novel. Later, when Stephen is a teenager, he's obsessed with religion and he's able to think in a clearer and more adult manner. And it coincides with the language used in the book. Paragraphs are more logically ordered than in the opening sections of the novel and the thoughts process logically. So Stephen's mind is more mature and he is now more coherently aware of his surroundings. Nonetheless, he still trust blindly in the church. And his passionate emotions of guilt and religious ecstasy are so strong that they get in the way of rational thought. It's only in the final chapter when Stephen is in the university that he seems to uh, seems truly rational. By the end of the novel, Joyce renders a portrait of a mind that has achieved emotional, intellectual, and artistic adulthood. So the gradual development of its emotional, intellectual, and artistic uh, means, uh, uh, faculties. Ma'am, ma'am, excuse yes. me. Yes. Ma'am, is there is there anything called psychological novel? Yes, there is, of course. So why not uh, say portrait of an artist as a psychological novel and a stream of consciousness? Stream of consciousness is a narrative technique. I understand. Yes. But uh, why? Uh, I mean, why more focus is given on the narrative technique and not on the psychological factor of the development of the um, Protagonist. It's almost the same thing, but uh, in history of English literature, it has been acknowledged because that was a new technique. It mm -hmm. was a new technique, a new development in fiction. That's why the more focus is on the technique, the narrative technique, because it was new, a novel technique used in fiction, stream of consciousness. And okay, psychological novel, you can have, you can find even in Richardson's formula. Because it talks about the psychology of the hmm. heroine, hmm. isn't it? Formula, so, Kansa, those are also psychological. 
we will incorporate these points in bildungsrom also you can you can hmm. yes of course you can the steam of consciousness you can okay okay so the development of uh, stephen's consciousness in a portrait of the artist is a young man is particularly interesting because in so far as stephen is a portrait of joyce himself uh, stephen's development gives us insight it was a development of a literary genius we find autobiographical elements so stephen's experiences he had the influences that transformed joyce himself into a great writer he is considered today so stephen's obsession with language its strange relation with religion family and culture and his dedication uh, to forging an aesthetic of his own this mirrors the ways in which joyce related to the various tensions in his own life during his formative years in the last chapter of the novel we also learn that genius though in many ways a calling also requires great work and considerable sacrifice it's not just that a genius is born they have to also constantly work it's a calling all right but it also requires great work and considerable sacrifice watching stephen's daily struggle to puzzle out his aesthetic philosophy we get a sense of the great task that i wear seen so we find a parallel between stephen's life and the life of uh, its author its creator james joyce so this is one thing uh, then another theme is the pitfalls of religious extremism the pit pitfalls the hazards the harmful effect of religious extremism uh brought up in a devout catholic family stephen initially ascribes to an absolute belief in the morals of the church as a teenager this belief leads him to two opposite extremes both of which were harmful at first he falls into the extreme of sin he indulges in uh, repeatedly sleeping with prostitutes and deliberately turning his back on religion though stephen sins willfully he is always aware that he acts in violation of the church rules he was aware of that then when father arnolds arnolds speech prompts him to uh, return to catholicism he bounces to the other extreme he came to the other extreme becoming a perfect near fanatical model of religious devotion and obedience he became a kind of religious fanatic a stream believer so eventually however stephen realizes that both these lifestyles both these extremes uh, the completely sinful and the completely devout the pious are extremes that have been false and harmful both the extremes are harmful so the pitfalls of religious extremism also sensual extremism he does not want to lead a completely debauched life but he also rejects austere catholicism because he feels that it does not permit him the full experience of being a human as stephen ultimately reaches a decision to embrace life and celebrate humanity after seeing a young girl wading at a beach there's something strange to him the girl is a symbol of pure goodness and of life lived to the fullest when we, he saw a young girl wading at a beach sea beach so uh, this is one thing another theme is role of the artist the role of the artist a portrait of the artist as a young man explores what it means to become an artist stephen's decision at uh, the end of the novel to leave his family and friends behind and to go into exile in order to become an artist it suggests that uh, john sees the artist as a necessarily isolated figure 
the author sees the artist as a necessarily isolated figure. In his decisions, Stephen turns his back on his community, refusing to accept the constraint of political involvement, religious devotion, and family commitment that the community places on its members. He had to avoid all these to become an artist. So it suggests that an artist is an isolated figure. However, though the artist is an isolated figure, Stephen's ultimate goal is to give a voice to the very community he is leaving, L-E-A-V-I-N-G. In the last few lines of the novel, Stephen expresses his desire to first to establish in the smithy of my soul, he said, the uncreated conscience of my race. I have to create, establish link with my race. So he recognizes that his community will always be a part of him, though he has abandoned it, left it to be alone. As it has created or shared his identity, when he creatively expresses his own ideas, he will also convey the voice of his entire community. Isn't it? As an artist, he is a voice of his entire community. Even as Stephen turns his back on the traditional forms of participation and membership in a community, he envisions his writing as a service to the community. So the role of an artist, or the role of the artist. Though the artist left his own community, still he represents his community. That is one thing. Then uh, Iris uh, autonomy is another thing, the need for Iris autonomy. Despite his uh, desire to stir clear of politics, Stephen constantly ponders Ireland's place in the world. He concludes that the Iris have always been subservient people, allowing outsiders to control them. In his conversation with the Dean of Studies at the University, he realizes that even the language of the Irish people really belongs to the English people. The Stephen's perceptions, uh, perception of Ireland's self-servience has two effects on his development as an artist. First, it makes him determined uh, to escape the bonds that his Irish ancestors have accepted. As we see in his conversation with Devin, Stephen feels an anxious need to emerge from his Irish heritage as his own person, free from the circles that have traditionally confined his countries. He wanted to go away from his Irish identity. He says, do you fancy I am going to pay in my own life and, pers and person, uh, sorry, person, deaths they met. He wanted to go away from his, that Irish life, that life of self-servience. Second, uh, Stephen's perception makes him determined to use his art, use his art to reclaim autonomy for Ireland. Using the borrowed language of English, he plans to write in a style that will be both autonomous from England and true to his Irish people. So autonomy of language. He wrote in English, but in a style which will be autonomous, different from the typical English style. In that way, he will be independent from England. Did you get it? How art, his art reflected Irish autonomy? Yes? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So when we very good. when we talk about the themes, we have to talk about the development of individual consciousness of Stephen and how it is related to the development of the conscious of the author himself, James Joyce himself. Then the pitfalls of religious extremism, even sensual extremism. What are the hazards, the harmful effects? Third, the role of the artist, the role of the artist. Okay. Though he left his community, though he left Ireland to live in different parts of Europe, how he is related, how he is attached to his community. 
how he becomes a bearer of the conscience of his race through his writing. Then fourth is the need for Irish autonomy, which has been autopic, though uh, it is not a uh, exercise in politics. The book is not an exercise in politics, still it has many elements of Irish nationalism, the need for Irish uh, autonomy, and how art can reflect that. How art can reflect that. He says that in the borrowed language of English, he plans to write in a style that will be both autonomous from England and true to the Irish people. So these are some of the themes. Some other themes uh, we can talk about is identity, search for identity, this religion, Irish freedom and the myth of uh, Daedalus. The myth of Daedalus has been used here, but this we are going to discuss while discussing the Igno material. Ma'am, excuse me. As, yes, Hello? I wanted to stop. Yes, yes. I wanted to uh, stop and ask you your feedback. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Uh, what can be the difference between this interior monologue and stream of consciousness? Yes, we will talk about it. We will talk oh. about it. Okay, okay. While, while discussing the ethno material, we'll talk about it. Just before that, we'll talk about the different motives. And okay, ma'am. E okay. Yes. Then we'll may, uh, ma'am, one more thing. In the last yes. part, when we will discuss the ethno material, may I ask three uh, questions then uh, related to this sure, novel? Sure. Sure. Okay. Sure. Then I'll ask later, not now. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, ma'am, I also have one question to Sharmishta here. Uh, mm -hmm. Ma'am, may I? Yes, of course. Ma'am, uh, why, uh, uh, as far as, as I remember, uh, Daedalus was the father of Icarus, right? So, yes. uh, he was that uh, who invented those things. Yes, huh, yes. we will talk about, about it too. Yes. Okay, why did, uh, my question is, uh, Ma'am, why did uh, James Joyce suddenly take Daedalus's name in here? Because I, I can't find anything very, you know, um, very very high in um, uh, Stephen's character because he is, he is uh, much like any other author or poet who is torn between personal life and aesthetic life, uh, personal mm -hmm. pleasures and the higher... Uh, Epiphany, uh, what is uh, epi epiphany? Uh, epiphany, yes. uh, epiphany that he is trying to achieve. So uh, yes. my question is, why Daedalus? Why bring in Daedalus here? We'll talk about it. Okay, we will talk about it. because he both were artists. Okay. The first point of resemblance is both were artists. We'll talk about it elaborately. Before that, the motives used in the novella, music. In music, especially singing, appears repeatedly throughout the portrait of the artist. And Stephen's appreciation of music is closely tied to his love for the sounds of language. As a young child, he turns Dante's thresh to a song. Apologize, pull out his eyes, pull out his eyes, apologize, he made it like that. And Dante is their uh, governess. So singing is more than just language. However, it's a language transformed by vibrant humanity. And indeed, music appears to the part of Stephen that wants to live life to the fullest. So music operates as a motif in uh, a portrait. Then we have also flight. Okay, what you were to talking about, the flight. You are talking about this flight of uh, Daedalus and his son, Icarus. So Stephen's, uh, did, uh, Stephen Didalus' very name embodies the idea of flight. Stephen's namesake, uh, Didalus, the Greek figure, or the figure from Greek mythology, is a renowned craftsman, craftsman, an architect, who designs the famed labyrinth of Crete. He designed the labyrinth of Crete for the king Minos. And Minos, after that, gives Daedalus and his son Icarus imprisoned in Crete. Crete, a place. C R E T E. But Daedalus makes plan to escape by using feathers. He used wax to fashion a set of wings for himself and his son. 
and Darwinus escapes successfully, but Icarus flies too high. The sunset uh, melts the wakes, holding Icarus' wings together, and he plummets to his death in the sea. So, uh, Icarus he fly uh, he flew too high, and the sunset melts the wakes, and he died in the sea. So, in this mythological reference, Joyce implies that Stephen must always balance his desire to flee Ireland with the danger of overestimating his own abilities, the intellectual equivalent of Icarus' flight too close to the sun. That can be one uh, match, okay, one resemblance. To diminish the dangers of atten uh, attempting too much too soon, Stephen develops his aesthetic theory fully before attempting to leave Ireland and drive seriously. He had to mature. He had to understand, develop the understanding of art. The birds that appear to Stephen in the third section of chapter 5 signal that it is finally time for Stephen to fly as an artist. Because he is now a full form artist, he is ready to fly. There are so many references in the book which will connect you uh, to, to the to Daedalus of, Daedalus of myth, or which connects different to Daedalus of the myth, and the flight motif is one of them. Okay. I hope you have got some points of uh, resemblance now. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry because oh. I am still in uh, still in Weathering Heights, so I haven't <laughs> completed Weathering Heights, so uh, I I didn't get the scope of laying my hands on uh, um, James Joyce. So I will definitely read the material <laughs> that I will be able okay. to pursue you, it. You all did it. You all did it. You read the but from the summary, you will not be able to know what is there in portrait of the artist as a young man in the text. You have to read the text, all of you. It is available on the net. You download uh, James Joyce portrait of the art. It is a must read because it's a must read. A portrait of the artist is a young man and read it. It's not that bulky also. And you will find a lot of the symbolism, motifs used in the book. Then we have also prayers, secular songs and Latin phrases. The book is full of these things. We can often tell uh, the Stephen's state of mind by looking at the fragments of prayers, songs, and Latin phrases that Joyce insert into the uh, text. It is connected. The prayer, the secular songs, and the Latin phrases are connected to the state of mind. So it is. It also functions as a kind of motif. It occurs throughout the text of uh, a portrait. Because in the book is uses stream of consciousness technique, we also find a number of symbols. Symbols are, as you know, objects, characters, figures, or colors used to represent abstract ideas or concepts. Colors are used as symbols here, like green and maroon. Uh, Stephen associates the colors green and maroon with his governess Dante. And two leaders of Irish resistance, Charles Parnell, and Michael David. In a dream after Parnell's death, uh, Stephen sees Dante dressed in green and maroon as the Irish people mourn their fallen leader. And this vision indicates that Stephen associates the two colors with the way Irish politics are played out among the members of his own family. And it is biographical also, remember, his father was associated with politics. Then Emma, the character of Emma also functions as a symbol. Emma appears only in glimpses throughout most of the uh, most of Stephen's young life, and he never gets to know her as a person. Okay. So she becomes a symbol of pure love, untainted by sexuality or reality. And Stephen worships Emma as an ideal of feminine purity. When he goes through the devoutly religious phase, he imagines his reward for his party as a union with Emma in heaven. So it's a kind of it's a 
spiritual love, pure love, untainted, untainted, unpolluted by sexuality. Ma'am, platonic so, love. Yes, platonic love. We can say. So Stephen's diary entry regarding this conversation portrays Emma as a real friendly. Uh, then we find in the diary entry only later when he is at the university uh, that there is a real conversation between Stephen and uh, Emma. And Stephen's diary entry uh, regarding this conversation portrays Emma as a real friendly and somewhat ordinary girl. But certainly not the goddess Stephen earlier uh, makes her out to be. So this more balanced view of Emma mirrors Stephen's abandonment of its team. This is also suggesting. When he realized it, it also suggests that he has abandoned the extremes. Okay. The extreme of complete scene or complete devotion in favor of a middle path and the devotion to the real appreciation of beauty. So these are some things we, I wanted to discuss before we move on to the glow material. As I told you earlier also, here we find in Unit 1, the context. Unit 1 is mainly about the context uh, of the period, of the time, of the book, of the author. So here we find discussion about Ireland and Parnell, that political leader. Uh, we were talking about him, who was caught or who was accused of uh, being involved with the married woman and in the end he died. Then jo we also know about Joyce's life. We get uh, almost two, three pages about James Joyce's life, his biography. Then the European literary context, the English language modernism, and it discusses the context that affected the making of Joyce as a writer and the writing of a portrait uh, also. And Joyce was an Irish modernist writer, remember, with a largely Europeanized sensitivity. He traveled extensively, lived in different parts of Europe, so he was influenced by it. So the various contests that went into the making of a portrait are listed in that unit, unit one. Number one, Joyce's own life. Second, his admiration for Parnell, that political leader. Third, uh, European literary influences like Ibsen. Another decisive influence on him was Arthur Simmons' book, The Symbolic Movement in Literature, published in 1899. Then friends like Malarmi and Badrila, they also influenced James Joyce. Then the hardness that Joyce's style exhibited uh, most of the time was due to the influence of French novelist Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert, who is the famous author of, yes, famous author of which book? Madame Bovary. It's often, very good, Madame Bovary. It is often prescribed for PG classes, this book. And next, uh, the intellectual climate associated with English language modernism, in which Joyce Eliot and Etra Pound were the leading light. So in modernism or modern modernism in, in English literature, the intellectual climate was developed, we can say, by James Joyce, T. S. Eliot, and Etra Pound. They were the leading figures. This is about the context. You need one in ignomatrial, you know about the context, where you also know about Ireland and Parnell, the political leader, the biography of James Joyce, the influences on James Joyce. Then you need to, it talks about general, overall structure and point of view. So narrative uh, structure here. A portrait in terms of genre can be seen as aesthetic autobiography. We were talking about Kunstler Roman. Kunstler K U N S T L E double R O M A N. Kunstler Roman, which is a form of Bildungsroman. Bildungsroman we have already discussed. Bildungsroman it means it's a growing of story. 
growing of the character or the protagonist to maturity, from innocence to maturity, from childhood to maturity, or from uh, ignorance to knowledge. What's a Bildung's roman? But constant roman is a special form of Bildung's roman. It's a special form of Bildung's roman which talks about the artistic development of the protagonist. The development of the protagonist as an artist. So Constant Roman literally we can say it's a artist novel. A artist novel. So a portrait has uh, in its elements both Bildung's Roman and Constant Roman. Because the, Stephen he developed as a person and he also developed and attained maturity as an artist. So it has elements both of Bildung's Roman and Constant Roman. When we speak of Bildung's Roman, we also spoke about great expectation. Isn't it? We can great expectations that we discussed as a Bildung's Roman, the character development of P, the protagonist. Then uh, when we speak of Bildung's Roman, we also speak of Somerset Morgan's of human bondage or Thomas Mann's uh, The Magic Mountain. These are all examples of Bildung's Roman. But when we speak of Kunstall Roman, another example will be Marcel Proust, Remembrance of Things Past. Remembrance of Things Past. It can be seen as an example of Kunstall Roman. So constant Roman means an aesthetic autobiography. Here it is a, um, a portrait of the artist that a young man can be described as an aesthetic autobiography. So I repeat, any coming of a story will be called a Bildung's Roman. But artistic development or the development of self-consciousness as an artist is termed as a constant Roman. So constant Roman can be seen as a part of or a type of Bildung's Roman. Are you clear? Yes, did you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Ma'am, uh, it is written that Bildung's Roman and Kunz, Kunz, Kunstel Romance. Yes, <laughs> so uh, it, is written that, uh, it is written that uh, Charles Dickens's novel, it is Great Expectation, it is also uh, that Kunstel Romance. Dickens Romance. No, it's Bildung's Romance. Yes, Bildung's Romance. Only Remembrance of Things Past is a Kunstel Romance. Hmm. And uh, Human Bondage also written. No, that is yeah. building Thank you, ma'am. Then open the structure. Let's talk about the structure again so that you will follow the story. Let's talk about the five chapters again so that you will not forget the story. Here it has been clearly written in your ignore material. The overall structure you need to read. Uh, the first chapter of a portrait so Stephen's development from infant awareness to the first assertion of his identity as an act of protest against injustice. First chapter. As an infant awareness of protest against injustice. Then the second chapter shows the growing isolation that comes with his adolescence, another phase in his life. With adolescence comes the growing isolation. And it culminates in the encounter with the prostitute. Then the third chapter, it represents the crisis, the crisis of adolescence and a temporary thought with the idea of taking up priesthood as a vocation. His interest in religion developed and he thought of the idea of, or he played with the idea of taking priesthood as a profession. Then the fourth chapter, the fourth chapter represents the climax of the development in his recognition of his true, true vocation. He thought about or there is conflict between um, sensuality and uh, this uh, priesthood or religiosity. Then he thought about himself and it, it represents the climax of development of his true vocation. He recognized that being an artist is his true vocation. And the fifth chapter shows 
the completion of his development and the declaration of his creed of freedom if we talk of the first two chapters as a structural unit then we find that these two chapters together they trace the awakening of religious doubts and sexual instincts culminating in the physical experience with the prostitute first two chapters there is a conflict between religious awakening yes yes Ma'am, please repeat Bildung's woman and Kunstal woman. Uh, Bildung's woman means any growing of story. The character grows from innocence to maturity, or from ignorance to knowledge. It shows the character development. The character uh, or the protagonist become better than he or she was in the beginning of the novel. That is Bildung's woman. But when we talk of Fulton's Fulton uh, Roman in particular, it shows the artistic development. It is a specific form of Bildung Roman, Bildung's Roman, which talks about the artistic development of the protagonist. For example, the development of Stephen, the character of Stephen in James Joyce, the uh, portrait of the artist as the young man. I will, I would like you to uh, do one thing. Uh, yesterday we talked about the glossary, M. H. Abrams, a glossary of literary terms. Yes, ma'am. Did you download it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it is available on the net. You download it, all of you. Then there, it is in dictionary or it's like a dictionary of literary terms. So you search B, B for Bildung's Roman. You will find Bildung's Roman there. Or uh, if it is not separately given, you will find it under novel. I think it is. It has been given separately. Bildung's Roman. After that, you will also get the meaning of uh, Kustom's Roman, because when you see words in uh, literary words in a glossary of literary terms, there you get the meaning. Then you get the feature, the features of that particular form or genre or anything or term. You also get some examples. You also get some references books, uh, books of reference. So it will be easy for you to understand the term and you can also use it in your answer. It will give clarity to your answer. Did you understand? Okay, ma'am. Yes, for epiphany, for Bilton's Roman, for all these key terms, go to um, MS Abrams, Glossary of Literary Terms and Source there, the meaning of it. I repeat, you will get the meaning, the features, some important works in that particular journal, even stream of consciousness. Source in MS Abrams Literary Terms, stream of consciousness. You will know what are the particular features associated with stream of consciousness. Then you will also get to know other books. What are the other books which employ the stream of consciousness technique? Do that. In fact, you need to remember the whole glossary. Read it again and again. Yes, so we were talking about structure. The overall structure. We discussed about chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we talked about how the first two chapters are related. The first two ch chapters, as a structural unit, yeah. we find there the two chapters together trace the awakening of religious doubts and sexual instinct. And it culminates in the physical experience with the prostitute. Then the next two chapters together, as another structural unit, they continue the cycle of scene and repentance. See, scene and repentance, how it is related to Christianity. Then the fifth chapter is a structural unit, stands uh, a little apart in terms of ironic distance. The chapter brings Stephen to the verge of exile and brings to the fore, to the front, his aesthetic theory and his life's goal. In the fifth chapter, his aesthetic theory and his life's goal have been the focus. 
and we have the spotlight is on the universities uh, university days and a major structure in device is memory in the whole uh, book this smaller unit is fed in uh, what joyce himself called a fluid succession of presence is a tightly constructed narrative unit and the linking of the episode is achieved through a series of evolutionary chains of images and themes the different images and themes they provide unity to all the five parts so you can refer to ego material for the narrative structure and uh, two three times the question on narrative structure came so you need to read this then unit 3 so in unit 2 you can get uh, answers on questions um, questions on point of view narrative structure and genre genre is a bildung roman and that question roman these things you will find in unit 2 unit 3 stephens growth and personality and here you find a section by section mapping you can follow the whole story here the section by section mapping so elaborately given in detail you go through it read it thoroughly so you find stephens growth here and it's not that when you write a question or uh, answer a question on bildung roman you can't pick from here because when you write about stephens growth when you speak about stream of consciousness or stephens growth you have to talk about bildung roman stephen growth means growth of the character means bildung roman the stephens aesthetic theory stephen and women so these are the things covered in unit 3 it covers all the 19 sections that constitute the five chapters and stephen's aesthetic theory is examined and his relationship with women is also looked at relationship with prostitute and relationship with emma the thing to one is the two extreme one is sensual and other is idealistic the thing to note is that stephen's aesthetic theory is not quite joyce aesthetic theory and that is attitude to women cannot be and should not be equated with joyce attitude to women so we always discuss or talk about the autobiographical elements in this novel still we have to remember that this is not an autobiography this is a work of fiction it's a novel there are certain tension occasioned by different demands that growing up and stephen stands as an artist makes on you and uh, the novel deals with these tensions and constantly takes into account the conflicts between stephen's drive towards adulthood and his drive towards becoming an artist throughout the narrative we find a constant tension conflict between Stephen's drive towards adulthood, maturity, Bildung's romance, and his drive towards becoming an artist, Kunstler's romance. Stephen's attempt to resolve the struggle between these two kinds of drives also deserves attention. When you discuss about the growth of Stephen, you have to discuss about these things. Did you get me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Yes, ma'am. Okay. Shall we continue? Yes, ma'am. Or do you technique. have any question? Oh, ma'am. Yes. Let's come to technique now. Uh, so unit four is about technique. Here we find variety of styles, repetitions and symbolism, stream of consciousness and epiphany. These are two important things. As I told you now, you go to glossary of literary terms by M. S. Abrams. and get it get in print these two means yes, these two things you have to find there copy and paste it on one page get a print of it stream of consciousness and another is epiphany then here in this unit unit 4 also linguistic features have been discussed and i told you while discussing the novel that linguistic features is integral to the development of the character how language changes with growth in stephen's character 
then birds, water, colors are chief among the symbols. When talking about symbolism and repetition or motifs, repetition means what we have already discussed, motifs. And symbolism, birds, water, colors are chief among the symbols. Their joints is woven into the structure and texture of a portrait. Along with the chief symbols, two more things have symbolic significance here, flowers and rose. But that you can find out when you go through the novel. Then look, epiphany. So what is this epiphany? Just I told you in one sentence in the beginning. By an epiphany, Joyce meant a sudden spiritual manifestation. A sudden spiritual manifestation or showing forth. With some stretching of the connotation of the word, it is possible to see a portrait as incorporating a sequence of related epiphanies in the form of a forward moving narrative. A sudden spiritual manifestation is seen. And we find uh, a sequence of epiphanies in a portrait. The showing for that John said uh, in mind was the reality of an object, person, and event. So epiphany uh, is the most notable example of the kind of showing forth that Joyce had in mind. What happens here is that Stephen, in a flash of insight, understanding, I-E-N-S-I-G-S-T, insight, understanding, recognizes the call of his artistic vocation. It came in a flash. And it transfigured, it is transfigured into a form of, it is transfigured into a form of the wedding girl who becomes for him the embodiment of art and beauty. And it suddenly happened when he was uh, just looking at the beach, the girl waiting on the beach. And the sudden insight in him that it is, and he sees it as an embodiment of art and beauty. The second thing to note is that another aspect of epiphany, the joy or the sense of enlightenment it creates, is conveyed to us in the wild transport of delight experienced by Stephen at the sight of the girl. So epiphany, the realization was sudden. The two aspects have a way of reinforcing each other. They resonate and bring forth or bring the, I mean, it regenerates and it brings the climax. So that episode need to be seen in its totality to realize its epiphany status. How that side, S-I-G-H-T side, looking at the girl who was waiting on the beach, it was a sudden moment of realization for Stephen use of epiphany. But uh, again, I would tell you to go to MS Avram's glossary and find out epiphany, which means a manifestation or a showing forth. And it has been used to, in a portrait of the artist as a young man. Then epiphany has become a standard term for description, frequent in modern poetry and prose fiction of a sudden fear into revelation of an ordinary object or scene. Sevi, in defense of poetry, called it the happiest moment. Earlier writer called this epiphany moment, poetic moment, moment, they said it. They told it moment. The epiphany, the word epiphany, came in the use letter. So Joyce uh, uh, had used the word epiphany, what the earlier authors had called moment. Thus, in Ahmed Abrams, we we find that Sely, in his defense of poetry, the poet Sely, the romantic poet Sely, in his defense of poetry, described the best and happiest moment arising on forcing and departing on bidden, or the visitation of divinity he talked about. And these are sudden moments in an artist's lifetime. So poetry redeems from decay. Or when William Wordsworth he talked of the moments, the sports of time. In short poems like while looking at daffodils, or the solitary reapers, or the girl Lucy, 
or, or in lucy poems we find sudden revelation or sudden realizations but at that time it was not named epiphany then you can also get from that uh, mh abrams the meaning of stream of consciousness it was a phrase used by william james in his principles of psychology the term was first used by william james in his principles of psychology in 1890 1890 to describe the all broken flow of perception thoughts feelings in the waking minds in the waking mind and it has since been adopted to describe a narrative method in modern fiction long passages of introspection said to in which the narrator records in detail what passes through a character's awareness are found in novelist from Samuel Richardson through William James brother Henry James in a, and this uh, principles of psychology is by William James you should not confuse him with his brother Henry James who is a novelist so we find that you were talking about the psychological fiction the term is applied to the novels of samuel richardson but we find stream of consciousness in henry james uh, then also in portrait of a lady by henry james portrait of a lady uh, then in 1920s the stream of consciousness is the name applied specifically to a mode of narration that undertakes to reproduce without a narrator's intervention it's a narrative technique it reproduces without a narrator's intervention the full spectrum and continuous flow of a character's mental process stream of consciousness reproduces a character's continuous flow of his mental process in which the sense perceptions mingle with conscious and half conscious thoughts the sense perception is painted mixed with conscious and half conscious thoughts memories expectations feelings and random associations you will find this in uh, uh, mh abrams or the history of literary terms then amrita was talking about interior monologue some critics use stream of consciousness interchangeably with interior monologue here in mh abrams you will get a clarification of that it is useful however to follow the uses of critics who use the former or stream of consciousness as a inclusive term stream of consciousness is a broader inclusive term denoting all the diverse means diverse means employed by authors to communicate the inclusive state and process of consciousness in a character stream of consciousness is an inclusive term which denotes the diverse means employed by the authors to communicate the inclusive state and process of consciousness in a character then what is interior monologue interior monologue monologue means dialogue to one one person talks mono dialogue two persons monologue one person talks it is reserved for the interior talking to answer okay. the literal meaning will be talking to answer is the reserve for that species of stream of consciousness it is also a form of stream of consciousness which undertakes to present to the reader the course and rhythm of consciousness precisely as it occurs in a character's mind interior monologue is to present to the reader the course and rhythm of consciousness precisely as it occurs to the character's mind in the interior monologue the author does not intervene the author does not intervene and change things or make it coherent so the author intervention is minimal as a describer guide a commentator and does not tidy the vagaries of the mental process into grammatical sentences or to logical or coherent order so here the difference will be that 
a stream of consciousness also the character's mind is exposed but the author intervenes because we find logical coherent descriptions also grammatical but when we speak of interior monologue there is less intervention by the author and the uh, and it is presented to the reader as it occurs to the character so in interior monologue the author does not intervene or intervene minimally as a describer guide and commentator and there is no attempt structure it into grammatical sentences or into logical or coherent order did you get me yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am okay yes ma'am ma'am uh, one more thing ma'am excuse me yes uh, so in case of a portrait of the artist we see the it is it is joyce's uh, nascent attempt to establish stream of consciousness through the maximum usage of interior monologue right yes yes because when a, it is a, just a, when you find in the narration there is no attempt at logic development of thoughts when the character is thinking of one thing suddenly another thing intervenes or there is no grammatical sentences some sentences will be given as it occurs to the uh, character's mind those uh, portions or those dialogues or those lines you can quote for interior monologue mm -hmm. as we find here okay ma'am so then oh yeah amrita go on so no no you you ask you No, no. I just wanted to say that the stream of consciousness is a major, um, is much a larger concept than interior monologue. Yes. Yes. And more complex. More complex. And uh, in case when we speak of the use of technique of uh, stream of consciousness, of course the author intervenes there. The author intervenes. The author asks why is a describer, a commentator. And you can cite statements from that stream of consciousness technique as interior modulus. When you find there is no such attempt as a logical or coherent order, or where you uh, don't find any attempt at grammatical sentences or to construct grammatical sentences, and it is presented to the readers as it occurs in the mind of the character. Did you get it? Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Amrita. Yes, ma'am. Uh, then, in in case of any narrative uh, structure related or how portrait is an uh, a novel on stream of consciousness, then my our answer should be that uh, it it maximum in maximum cases it shows the uh, examples of interior monologue. Then then I will quote some uh, lines from the novel to prove that, and later on we will see that in in this way Joyce tries to. uh established stream of consciousness in this novel but it fully flourishes in finnegan's wake and ulysses right yes yes good yes. okay you can also talk about other novels also when you um, um, talk about stream of consciousness how it has been developed in uh, virginia wool yes yes just a second let me just uh, finish this line you can also talk about dorothy richardson Uh, her twelve volumes novel pilgrimage. How it employed stream of consciousness technique. Or uh, you can also just mention that Virginia Woolf also employed it in Mrs. Dolloway or to the lighthouse. You can also talk about William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. So when you are writing about stream of consciousness novel, you can mention about its features and uh, how those features uh, are seen in. Um, James Joyce, a portrait of an artist. You can also compare it to other novels, just by citing or just by mentioning the names. Yes, your questions, please. Yes, Kiri sir, want to tell something? Yes, one, one second, please. Uh, Abhi Bhani, man. Abhi Bhani. Abhi Bhani. I do not. Yes, Abhi yes. Bhani. Yes, you have, you often get questions on uh, stream of consciousness, and also you get questions on Abhi Bhani. Epiphany, we discussed earlier that 
epiphany means a sudden spiritual manifestation. The literal meaning will be like showing forth. A portrait has been uh, called uh, or a portrait implies epiphany, sudden realization, a sudden spiritual realization. And I told you earlier that uh, you can find the meaning of epiphany from M. H. Abrams glossary, a glossary of English literary term. You go to the internet, type M. H. Abrams a glossary of literary term, seventh edition PDF. At this a glossary of literary term, uh, M. H. Abrams PDF. You will get a copy of the book. There you go. It is the words are given in dictionary, dictionary order. You can find the meaning of any literary word from this particular book. You go to E, E for epiphany. There you will get the meaning of epiphany. The meaning of epiphany, the features associated with epiphany. How earlier also the poets, the writers, they had also sudden realization. They had also sudden realization, and they called it moment, the moment of realization. So epiphany is a manifestation. It's a standard term for description, okay, frequent in modern poetry or prose fiction, of the sudden fear into revelation of an ordinary object or scene. By watching an ordinary object or scene, the author or the character or the artist. They flow sudden realization. As in case of this story, James Joyce, a portrait. Stephen was watching a girl waiting in the sea beach, and he had the sudden realization that the girl is an embodiment of art and beauty. That is epiphany. Did you understand? Yes, I understood. Okay. Any other question? May I ask, ma'am? Yes, sure. Uh, ma'am, there is a long question. Uh, uh, give a detailed note on the three broad movements in a portrait of the artist as a young man. Which three broad movements are being referred here? Is it Irish Revolution, uh, symbolism, and the initiation of stream of consciousness? These three. Can I write these three points? Movement. It has been mentioned in the question. Movement. Yes, a detailed note on the three broad movements uh, in uh, depicted in a portrait of the artist as a young man. Sin then, which three movements are it is ref are uh, I, means referred here? Which three? Celtic, Celtic revival is also a movement that is referred here. That in I history, why? Yes, in history, why? Yes, in history, why? You will get it in the context in unit one. You'll get it in unit one. You are right. You the stream of consciousness is one. Good. Those things you can mention. Yes. Ma'am, then these three are these three points correct yes. from my side? Irish Revolution yes. or Celtic Revival, symbolism mm -hmm. in art mm -hmm. and stream of consciousness is established. Yes. yes. It will be fine. It will be fine. Okay. Yes. These are the three important things. Okay, and two more questions are there, ma'am. Uh, one is uh, elaborate the various styles used by Joyce in a portrait. Then under the styles, I can write uh, one is obviously stream of consciousness is establishment. Number two yes. is uh, uh, symbolism, and number three as epiphany. Yes, of course you can write. Good. Yes. Okay, and the last one is comment on the structure of a portrait, and it is, I think, the same question: narrative technique or st how stream of consciousness is established, right? Stru structure, structure is something else. It it came in December seventeen. It is related. Yes, it is related. But when you write about the narrative structure, as we discussed now, the five part. Yes. The how the novel five develops. Part. Uh, yes, how the novel develops. The overall structure that is in unit two. You will find it in unit two. Mm. Okay, ma'am. And, and so you must mention about the myth, the myth of myth, that Daedalus myth. Okay. 
how it is related to the development of an artist okay ma'am yes. then uh, then the narrative technique uh, how the novel develops and the usage of myth mm -hmm. uh, these three if combined then i can i i think the answer is formed for structure yes yes the structure of the novel uh, first uh, uh, first structure you have to first clearly mention that the book has been structured into five part chapter 1 2 3 4 5 okay. how it has been developed in these five parts Okay. and how these are related also you find okay. that in unit 2 ma'am that you were okay. reading chapter 1 chapter 2 that one na no? overall structure yes i was reading about it page 12 I don't know about the page number because I don't have the geometry with me right now. Just I have noted it down. Ma'am, Daedalus. Uh, yes, ma'am. Daedalus has a mythological connection. We know his uh, second name. Is there any uh, mythological reference to his first name as well, Stephen? Is it no, somehow? No, it's a very common. No, it's a very common English name, Stephen. Stephen is a very common English name. And somehow, ma'am, uh, I I just came to know somewhere that there was a saint called Saint Stephen or something like that. Yes, so yes, his course. his name, so he his first name is also bearing a reference to that. Uh, is it necessary to write in the answer? Yes, yes. As you have mentioned it, you can you can Saint Stephen is a very famous name. You can. associate see in literature nothing is absolute everything is relative and you can interpret it just you have to justify your interpretation then ma'am uh, do you could you please elaborate the uh, the story or the relevance of this and stephen here means how to connect that with a portrait's uh, plot actually portrait's uh the way i can establish the connection between daedalus and smith and why stephen has been given the name daedalus here in the same way if i write stephen's uh, reference then i have to uh, prove how the how the story of saint stephen is related to this novel then that i fully complete uh, completely i don't know you can you can just write that there is a, ma a major part of the novel has been devoted to the religious ethnic the religious realization in uh, stephen because he talked to religion for a long time and he even dreamed of becoming or he thought of becoming a priest that part that religious extremism part or his development of religious fanaticism that part you can relate to the first him stephen is justified because we find a considerable part of his development a considerable part of his development has been devoted to this religious development and another part didalus because it has been devoted to artistic development that way you can justify ma'am i was just thinking upon contemplating i was just uh, i just came to this if we uh, like write like this i was uh, with due regards to amrita's vision also but uh, if I, if we like uh, write this and in this way stephen as a very common man and dedalus as a very ambitious man i think uh, the these comparison between a very common man's attitude towards life like visiting uh, those places not uh, not uh, very much appreciated by the society and uh, his ambition towards uh, to being a clergyman i mean uh, as i uh, 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 understood from your explanation so these two are varying ideas so yes. the the tear the dilemma yes. between uh, the two uh, parts of him can be very much being expressed being common and being uncommon ha huh, so it would be so very easier to establish ha huh, it would be very easier to establish the point of you know comparison and uh, it would be very easier to uh, make <laughs> the examiners convince about the ideas i suppose yes even you can write both the things even you can write both the things if you can because uh, there are different perspective to look at things. in the same answer ha huh, maybe but uh, it should sound convincing okay so you have to employ your writing skill to make it convincing to the examiner okay it's better not to write i think <laughs> because on the one 
hand we are talking about a comparison between common and uncommon hmm. but there we are talking about the two extremes hmm. so any one we have to choose right yes any other question see tomorrow will be uh, a full class of 2 hours we have two novels to discuss the first half we will discuss a passage to india and the second half or last one hour we will discuss the prime of jane prodi muriel sparks novel so you read the story if you can so that we will not have to repeat things we have less time two hours two novels it will be too less and uh, a passage to india is such a uh, well known novel one would like to talk about it for hours and hours still we have to manage time and talk about both the novels so let's stop for today we shall meet tomorrow yes ma'am thank you ma so much ma'am excuse me thank you hello ma'am uh, then i i had uh, two questions from uh, heart of darkness because yesterday there was a connection error so i could not ask so there so should i ask that tomorrow or today let's keep all the questions for tomorrow tomorrow okay. we will just read the summaries in the in the first of first one hour we will discuss a passage to india elaborately we will keep less time for muriel's part and the last half an hour maybe we will discuss or we can okay, also see the time it if it requires okay ma'am thank okay. you okay let's stop today then did you understand all of you yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am and over the yes, idea of the whole thing okay let's stop today meet you tomorrow then thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am